It's a real pleasure to be with your group today. It's the first time I've done a, a Thai group session. So it's a real, real pleasure. I've wanted to do this for a long time. So uh, is, is this thing sharing yet? Yes, it is. Richard. Are you seeing my presentation? Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just put it on full mode. So today I'm going to talk about the power of opportunity. That's also the uh, title of my new book. And today I have four powerful lessons for entrepreneurs. So hopefully there are a lot of business people and entrepreneurs in the audience. Lesson one, there's no reason to be average. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, the bell curve, the normal distribution of effort and results. The vast majority of companies, oops, I thought I had the pen on, just hold on, let me just, there we go. The vast majority of companies have results in this zone, right in the middle, it's called average results. Unfortunately, if you benchmark yourself against competitors having average results, you're probably not doing all that well. That's because the vast majority of corporate profits in any sector, in any industry, are taken by the people right here on the right tail, the one or 2% of companies that get most of the profits. I think a better way of looking at the distribution between effort and results is world income distribution. As we all have heard of the famous 1%, who have the vast majority of wealth in the world. Well, typically the top 1% earn 100 times the average amount and the top 10% earn about 10 times average. This is definitely, this area of wealth is where you wanna be. The same distribution applies to company profits. McKinsey did a study a few years ago of the average economic profit for the top 3000 companies in the world. And again, we see this power curve, it's called, and the top 20% of companies have an average profit of this much, 1.18 billion. The next 20% is one-tenth of that. The next 20% is one-tenth of that. And the bottom 40% actually lose money with the average company only making 102. And you can see even within the top 20%, the 1% here at the top of the power curve are getting most of the gravy. The same thing happens in the Indian market. I did a study of the largest 100 Indian companies ranked by Pat over a several year period. Again, we see this power curve. The top 20 firms earned 86%, sorry, 68% of total Pat. And more remarkably, the top 20 firms are 95 times more Pat than the bottom 20. And these are all big companies. A recent study by Marcellus Investment Advisors found a similar result. They found that the top 20 companies in India earn 70% of total Indian corporate profits. So very few companies succeed in getting most of the profit. And that's true in every industry. Which leads us to lesson two. How do you reach this magic 1%? Well, it takes focus. And uh, I like to uh, benchmark against this guy, Steve Jobs, who was undoubtedly the most successful entrepreneur of the last 50 years. When he was brought back to Apple in 1996 to run things, the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. And the first thing he did was to cut the product line from 355 computers, in those days there were only computers, down to only 10. And people said, how are you gonna make money? He said, well, those computers are no longer a big opportunity. I wanna focus my resources on the next big opportunity. He didn't know what it was then, but he found out and that's exactly what he did. He focused on a series of big opportunities. The company still continues to focus only on golden opportunities. As Tim Cook has said, we are the most focused company that I know of. We say no to great opportunities in order to keep the amount of things we focus on very small in number so that we can put enormous energy behind the small number of opportunities we do choose. And the results speak for themselves. This article from the Wall Street Journal basically says that in the world, there are a thousand companies that make smartphones. Yet only one company, Apple, makes 92% of the industry's profit. That means that 999 companies are making 8% of the industry's profit. 
And if you see how Apple's revenue is, 70% of it comes from one product, the iPhone. So that's real focus on the best opportunities. Unfortunately, most entrepreneurs, whether they're new or experienced, don't focus on the best opportunities. They don't focus on opportunities at all most of the time. They focus on solving small problems. We all know that every day, if you're an entrepreneur, you're overwhelmed with all these things that you have to do, firefighting, problem solving, and so on. As a result, focusing on the best opportunities tends to get shoved to the bottom of the priority list. It should be at the top, actually. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, that should be the most important thing that you focus on. If you don't do it, after all, who will? Usually nobody. I'm sure uh, most of you recognize these four guys. These are all famous Indian entrepreneurs who started with nothing and became billionaires. They did it by focusing on the best opportunities. They focused on big opportunities that turned into big profitable companies. How could they do that when they were starting out? How could they possibly focus on big opportunities? Well, they could because opportunities are free. All opportunities are free. You can't go to the opportunity shop to buy an opportunity because it doesn't exist. All opportunities are equally free and they're available to you. So the question is, which ones are you going to choose? If you're smart like these guys, you'll choose, you'll choose great opportunities. Most people do not. The great thing about the best opportunities is that they attract resources. I've met hundreds and hundreds of managing directors of Indian companies and inevitably they complain to me that they can't attract resources. They can't get money, they can't get the best team. But what, what they're really lacking are great opportunities because great opportunities are like powerful magnets that will attract all of the resources and team that you need. You know, a couple of years ago, I met a guy, a 20 year old IIT dropout who had raised $20 million from Tiger Global, a US VC. Now, how could a guy like that do it? He had no track record. The thing is what VCs fund is not really entrepreneurs. What they fund is opportunities. They fund great, great opportunities that have huge scale and profit potential. If you have opportunity, money comes. That's the words of Prem Watsa, the famous chairman of Fairfax Holdings. But most people do not have a great opportunity. That's why they don't get funded. So how do you find the best opportunities? Leads us to lesson three. Well, let's back up a bit and talk about what creates opportunities. I've thought a lot about this. I've written two books about it. And in a nutshell, to put it simply, opportunities are created by change in your environment. If we lived in a static environment, there wouldn't be opportunities because nothing would change. Fortunately, we're all living in the modern age when there's tremendous pace of change and that creates a lot of opportunities. How does change create opportunities? Well, to illustrate that, I'll use a product that all of us have, a mobile phone. I'm sure uh, many of you who are over 30 had a phone like this once, a Nokia feature phone. And then one day you changed over to have a Blackberry. And uh, a bit later you dumped the Blackberry and got a phone like this, a smartphone. Now what change in the environment of the mobile phone industry drove the evolution from the feature phone to the Blackberry to the smartphone? I have asked hundreds of people back in the days when I met groups of people this same question and virtually nobody could correct, uh, guess the right answer actually. But there was one key driver of change and it didn't come from the mobile phone industry. This key driver of change comes from outside the mobile phone industry, it comes from the telecom industry and that key driver of change is bandwidth. With a 1G phone like the Nokia, you could basically have only phone calls and SMSs. With a 2G phone, you could add email to create a Blackberry. But once you went to 3G, you could put a networked computer on the phone and basically expand utility by a thousand times. Nokia did not make use of this change even though they surely saw it and they got wiped out. Same with Blackberry. A good example of a company that did benefit from this change in bandwidth was Netflix. 
Netflix started as a very much offline company. Their model was to deliver DVDs by mail to people at a time when people watch movies on DVDs. But as soon as 3G became available, Netflix very abruptly switched to an online streaming model, which many people thought they were crazy, their customers were angry, but it was wildly successful. They were the first mover. And let's face it, if they hadn't switched to online streaming, they would have also been wiped out. So unfortunately, most companies do choose to be wiped out. Uh, a few years ago, I was on the teaching staff of Harvard Business School in Asia. I was uh, fortunate to be invited to a presentation by Professor J. Bruce Harold. Professor Harold had studied companies all over the world, all sectors, all sizes, and he had found that only 1.7% of companies last more than 40 years. That's fairly remarkable since it's only half a human lifespan. Now, how long should companies be able to live? Frankly, forever. Professor Harold found that companies die because the opportunities they pursue have a life cycle. All opportunities have a life cycle. It might be 100 years like Coca-Cola. It might be a couple of years like a lot of tech products. And because change makes their opportunities irrelevant, companies always have to look for new ones. Now, in reaction, in reaction to change, many companies either choose to stand still and do nothing, as Kodak did, and die, or they pursue new opportunities that don't adapt to change, like Nokia or BlackBerry, and they die. Uh, the most successful companies, whether they be startup or existing companies, choose new opportunities that adapt best to key drivers of change. It's not enough to adapt best to key drivers of change. However, you also must have the right mission. Now, mission uh, is often something Somebody, that companies write a mission statement and pay no attention to it. But actually, your mission is very important. And unfortunately, most people have a mission of profit. It's regrettable that nobody will pay you because you're needy or greedy. It's unfortunate, but it's a fact. Profits are a score. They are a result. They are not a cause. Opportunities are the cause. Just to give you an example, let's say that you wanted to lose 10 kilos. Would having the desire or goal of losing 10 kilos in any way, shape, or form help you lose 10 kilos? Of course not. You would have to do things like run three times a week or diet, exercise, and so on. So having a goal of profit is absolutely unhelpful. The best opportunities are actually focused on creating tremendous value. And the key driver of value is utility. In other words, useful service to your customers. Of course, you must have useful service to yourselves, but more importantly, to your customers. If you were ranking, for example, the amount of utility provided by this feature phone and this BlackBerry, it would be really small compared to the amount of utility created by this device. In fact, this, this phone should be much bigger. So you must focus on useful service, not profits. The best opportunities are also value arbitrages in which you see all opportunities involve an exchange of value between a customer and a company, all business opportunities as well. I mean, Google, I think, is the example, best example of value arbitrage. When you use Google, you pay nothing. Yet a recent study found that each user of Google was getting an average economic value per year of over $12,000. So how do you pay Google? You pay them with your, by giving them your data. If you tried to sell your data yourself, you get nothing. But by giving them your data, they aggregate it for billions of people and they make billions of dollars. So basically, they're, you're trading something that's worthless to you for something that's valuable. And they're trading something that's uh, valuable. You know, you get the idea. Basically, it's a great value arbitrage. But how did most entrepreneurs choose opportunities? Unfortunately, most entrepreneurs I've met, and I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs, most of them use the Xerox machine. They copy others. This is generally not a route to success. If you want to be a success and choose great opportunities, typically you can't be a cover band. You have to write your own song. You have to be different. You have to be unique. 
So what's your Bohemian Rhapsody? Even if you can't sing the song yourself like Freddie Mercury, you should be able to create a song that millions of others want to sing. So how do you discover these wonderful golden opportunities that are so special and going to make you rich? Well, do you need to be a genius like Steve Jobs to choose the best opportunities to see them? Well, hopefully not because I'm not a genius and I don't know any geniuses. I don't think most of the people, I mean, frankly, probably never met a genius. So hopefully you don't need to be a genius. Or is it really just about luck? A lot of people think great success is just about luck. Well, what if you were very lucky and you had some rich uncle you never heard of leave you 50 crores and you went to a wealth manager and said, okay, I've got 50 crores. I need to invest them in equity. Tell me about your process for choosing equities. And the wealth manager said, well, you know, we had a whole bunch of analysts. They were expensive, but we realized it's all just about luck. So we got rid of them and we just hired this monkey. And every day he puts on a blindfold and shoots darts at the stocks. And that works as well as any other way. Would you choose a wealth manager who chose stocks using a blindfolded monkey? I've asked that of hundreds of managing directors and not a single one would choose the monkey yet. They, they are not using a process. And would you agree that using a systematic process creates better outcomes? I've asked this question of hundreds of entrepreneurs and of course everyone agrees that using systematic processes creates better outcomes. You wouldn't go to a surgeon who didn't use a systematic process. Your CA uses a systematic process, engineers use them, factories use them. In fact, systematic processes are the foundation of the modern world. So ask yourself these questions. Do you currently use a systematic process to find, evaluate, and choose the best opportunities? I have asked over 300 managing directors of companies, Indian companies of all types this question, and not a single one uses a systematic process to find, evaluate, and choose the best opportunities. So they might as well be hiring the monkey. Ask yourself this question. Is there any reason you don't need a systematic process to find, evaluate, and choose the best opportunities? Again, everyone agrees there is no reason. So that leads us to lesson four, how to use a systematic opportunity process. I have a consulting company called Open Mind. And of course, I use the open mind process, a six step process I've created for uncovering, recovering, and discovering opportunities for sustained profitable growth. And this process starts with something called an opportunity audit. Now, most people do a financial audit every year. It's where you count all your money. And uh, what is an audit? And actually an audit is a picture of reality. So when you do a financial audit, you don't just count half the money you try to do count it all. So it's an accurate picture of reality. Why do we do an audit? Because opportunities are created by changes in your environment. So in order to see opportunities, it just makes sense that you must be aware of your environment. And auditing your opportunity environment requires to the best extent possible full awareness. It's unfortunate that most of us have limited awareness, not by choice, but by, because we're kind of in a box. We all have our own view of reality. So imagine you're an ant and your entire view of reality is this. You live in this landscape. And one day, a little ant helicopter lands in the middle right here on your little helicopter pad and out steps a very rich ant and he says, hey, buddy, if you really want opportunities, you got to have a wider view of the world. OK, this isn't what the world looks like. And you go into the air in his helicopter and suddenly you see this. Wow, there is a much wider view of my environment. And the whole time I was sitting on the elephants here, here. And no wonder my environment was so uh, disruptive. So what does your opportunity environment consist of? There are four zones. The most important zone is your mission. That is what is guiding you. What the hell you're doing. So most companies really don't take a very 
thorough view of their actual mission and what mission of service they're offering to people. And then the next part of your model is, sorry, the, of your environment is your model. So these are internal aspects of your environment, your mission and model. Then externally, you have your market and everything outside mission market, uh, sorry, mission model and market is your domain. So for example, for the mobile handset industry, bandwidth was in their domain. And most people don't pay much attention to the domain, but it's often a very large source of opportunities. Now, in order to audit your four segments of your opportunity environment, the easiest way and the, the, the way that I use is to talk to people and ask questions. So I talk to entrepreneurs, I talk to team members, I talk to customers. If it's a B2B company, I talk to customers, customers. I talk to consumers, channels, competitors, investors, industry experts, and domain experts. And anyone can do that themselves, but you, you need a big view. And it's amazing when you talk to all these people, including people inside your company, you eventually assemble an inventory. You create an opportunity inventory. Sometimes when I consult for a company, I'll have an inventory of over 100 opportunities. These come from all four segments of the opportunity environment. And uh, they include current opportunities you're either pursuing now or thinking of pursuing, old opportunities you thought about pursuing but didn't do or did do but failed at, new opportunities that you'll discover through this process, and what I call non-opportunities. Those are things that you're doing that really aren't opportunities that you probably should stop doing to free up resources. Now you have that big inventory of opportunities. How do you find the 1% that are gold? It's regrettable, but golden opportunities are not golden on the outside, they're golden on the inside. So you need a way to evaluate them. So I go through several steps to evaluate opportunities. After creating my inventory, I'll filter them through key drivers of change. And then I'll use nine value filters, the most important being utility. And then four alignment filters. An opportunity has to be aligned with your entire opportunity environment, otherwise you can't execute it properly. If you wanna see an example of a perfectly aligned opportunity, look at an iPhone. That's a perfectly aligned opportunity. And then you get from that your very small number of best opportunities to pursue. Obviously, in, this, in a, a short presentation, I don't have the scope to go into this in great detail, so if you're interested in learning more, there's a very detailed description of the opportunity process in this book, The Power of Opportunity. And in my older book, The Master of Opportunity and Make It Big, there are inspiring stories of 18 Indian entrepreneurs who've gone for rags to riches uh, and uh, the lessons they've learned and that you can apply. So these books are available on Amazon or on Flipkart. So that's the end of the road for this presentation. I'm happy to take your questions. If uh, your question can't get asked or you think of it later, please feel free to contact me at, by email. Please write down my email address right now. This is your opportunity to do that. And my website address. My website has lots of information. I'm also on LinkedIn at Richard Rothman and my op guru YouTube channel has about 40 educational videos. So I invite you to subscribe to that to see my videos. So I'm ready for your questions now. And it's been a pleasure to do this presentation for you. Look forward, look forward to answering your questions. So folks, if you have any questions, I would request you all to post them on the web chat and then I can ask Richard. Uh, Richard, if you could just go back a slide. I have myself have a couple of questions. One more, sorry. One more. Okay. Is this slide, this is the slide you want? Yeah, this is the one okay. I want. So my question over here, Richard, is that uh, when you are doing this analysis, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, or where do you start realizing which one is a non-opportunity, which one is an opportunity, and, 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 and can, I mean, is there a way to predict the future, or, or do you know the technology trend? What is the environment in five years from now? How do you make that assessment? No, you do not have to predict the future because that's not possible. 
Okay. However, as you do this opportunity audit, it mm -hmm. becomes quite clear generally what the trends are, what the dominant trends are. And I'm a big believer that the trend is your friend. Okay. So you will get a good picture of whether you are following trends. And the trends that I'm most interested in are what I call the key drivers of change. Okay. So for example, when Nokia was facing an uncertain future, it should have seen that the key driver of change would not be what would be bandwidth. That with bandwidth, you could provide more utility to your customers and therefore do more. Most companies instead tend to focus on maximizing the return on their past investment and hoping that customers will be satisfied with the, with the degree of technology and service provided by that. But generally that isn't the case, particularly in fast moving sectors where, that are driven by tech. Got it. And, and in your estimation, how many do you think use this kind of uh, matrix? Well, I don't think, uh, I think there are various types of matrices that look at businesses through various filters. I'm not sure there are any others that specifically do it this way. Uh, I am the first opportunity consultant in the world. So that doesn't mean there aren't others doing similar things. But I think the particular way that I look at it is rather unique. Uh, of course, you know, there are many, there are many ways of looking at opportunities. And uh, I, I, I feel that most of them are a little stuck in the past and look too much, frankly, at comparing yourself to competitors. I don't think that's particularly useful because if you compare yourself to competitors and see competitive advantage as your main filter, you know, the Michael Porter type of theory, you will tend to copy others and fall behind. You will, you will focus on countering competitors rather than providing useful service to customers. And in that you miss a lot of opportunities. I focus more on useful service and utility rather than competitors, because let's face it, uh, take an example of Netflix, which managed to uh, survive and thrive, even when their, when their business model became disrupted, right? Their, dis their business model of using mail became completely disrupted because nobody was gonna use DVDs anymore. Instead of focusing on maximizing the return on investment or countering their competitors, uh, they, they switched to an entirely new way of doing things that nobody else had done because that would have given the maximum amount of useful service to customers. It was clear based on the key drivers of change that people would be able to stream videos and that would be a better way of doing it. So they switched to it. They didn't, they didn't benchmark themselves against competitors when they did that. Okay, so this is, this is a better filter and better way of looking at it than I believe the prevailing models of competitive advantage. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, uh, what you're trying to say is create an absolutely new market, create a new product, create a new use for it, create a new need for it, uh, you know. Well, it can be. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be new either. It, it, it could simply be a better way of doing things. You know, I found in dealing with many clients that often companies have a set way of looking at their industry and what their customers want. For example, I had a, a client in the yarn business. Most people don't know anything about the yarn business. And he was, they were in a very particular corner of the yarn business called Fancy Yarn. This is yarn that goes into men's shirts to give it fashion value. In all the companies, I met all the companies in the industry, they all said that customers only wanted three things, quality, delivery on time, and low price. Now, naturally, every company in the world wants those three things. Sure. But when I actually met not only their customers, but their customers' customers, in other words, the people that buy textile to make shirts, they all wanted fashion value. And none of these customer companies were giving it because they were so stuck 
on the idea that customers only wanted certain things. The fact is that most of them had never even talked to their customers. They were too busy worrying about their margin and haggling over price and other commoditized factors. Okay, they weren't looking at how they could actually give useful service to their customers. Thanks, Richard. Richard which, this most customer, which most companies, frankly, don't because they're too busy thinking about self-service or profits. So, Richard, there's a request from one of our audience member, Milan. He's hmm. asking you if you could kind of uh, take us with, with an example and take us through this opportunity uh, filters. You know, if you could, you know, if you've done yep. any work with an example and how you've arrived at various opportunities and which was the one that your client or your, you chose eventually. Yeah, sure. So, uh, for example, I recently had a, a, a client in the, uh, in, 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 and excuse me, these are industries you may never have heard of. Okay, okay. but so I had a client that is a, in, the, in an industry called surveying, ship surveying. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people would not be familiar with this industry, but actually every shipping container that comes into India, and there are over 50 million shipping containers a year arriving in India, have to be tracked as they arrive in India go through India to their destination and then depart India. So my client is a company that tracks 90% of the shipping containers coming in and out of India. And uh, frankly, it sounds like a great business when you have a 90% market share and no competitors, but they're being disrupted by drivers of change. The main driver of change is technology. India is actually the last country in the world that still track shipping containers using paper. Okay, everything, every other company, it's digital. And in fact, their type of business doesn't even exist any longer in any other comp company, sorry, any other country in the world. So the question is, what should they do to survive? Okay. Now, obviously, the most obvious uh, way is to, the key driver of change, obviously, in their industry is technology. But I also found... <clears throat> that they were not paying any attention to the companies that actually ship goods. Their customers were all shipping lines. These are the ones who own the shipping containers. And that industry has become compressed to down to about four companies control almost all the shipping in the world. So those companies aren't doing very well and they're all, they've been driving this, com they, this company hadn't been allowed to raise its prices in 10 years because of the concentration in the industry and the industry isn't doing very well. But in doing the analysis and talking to people, I found that there are hundreds of companies in India that actually ship things by container and have a variety of needs that aren't being catered to. Theoretically, the shipping line should be doing this for them, but they don't because they're not, they're not in the business of helping the shipper do too much. They don't have the capacity they, they run ships. They don't have on ground capacity to do very much other than sell shipping. So there was a big opportunity for this company to provide services to the shipping lines customers. Okay. Many services now that were only provided by companies that are very disorganized and don't have a nationwide footprint. This company has, this company actually has a nationwide footprint with operations at every shipping depot all over the country in hundreds of locations, which gives them the ability to do that. So they've gone into that opportunity. So in looking at this opportunity, the key driver of change wasn't just technology, that's another opportunity they're pursuing, but we looked at the value for the cust their customers' customers. It's very useful for companies, especially in B2B, to not only talk to their customers, but talk to the customers of your customers because that's who they're selling to. What are they actually trying to get and what services do they need? Very often you can find areas of service that are outside the box you considered your own by looking that, at that kind of utility. And for instance, for this company in the surveying business, there's huge scale potential and hundreds of neglected customers outside of the usual box of customers that they worked with. But to do this, very often, 
to get these kind of opportunities, you need to change your business model. Okay. This alignment process is very important. Okay. Unless your mission can be and model can be aligned with your market and domain, you cannot succeed. You will not execute properly. Very often companies are simply failing with a good opportunity because they lack alignment. Okay. As a result, they don't execute properly. I've had many clients who, who fall into this particular problem of alignment and they don't really realize it. And often because it could be that every company in your industry is also poorly aligned. Okay. So there's a big opportunity in doing it better. Yeah. Very often in India, the quality of service provided in general is very poor. Okay, so you're, that's another reason you should not benchmark yourself against your competitors. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope I've uh, answered that question somewhat. I hope, Milan, you understood. Uh, the if you question, don't, uh, and I, I want to add, if anyone needs clarification, feel free to send me an email. Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to get your feedback. If I haven't answered a question clearly, I want your feedback. And I'd be happy to try by email or phone later on. So the follow-on question, Richard, is with respect to technology. Uh, and yeah. I think Prabhup is asking it with respect to blue space technology. And we've seen in the past 30, 40 years, sometimes, you know, the technology was ahead of its time and, and, and or they never got, got it working in the right applications. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you worked with any tech companies who have got a good technology, but uh, they just are not ready or, or the market is not ready uh, and how do you then assess the opportunity for them? Well, I agree that uh, you could be ahead of your time. Okay. I think the way to, I think going through the process of auditing your environment is a very crucial area to assess whether you're ahead of your time. Mm -hmm. Let's say that, uh, you're a tech company and you can't raise money. I, I, as I said, I've met hundreds of startups and the vast majority of these startups are not able to raise money. Got it. If you're not able to raise money, that's a, that's a pretty good clue that something's missing among these say nine elements. And it could be that the scale potential that you're predicting isn't there in within a reasonable time frame, or the degree of relevance is not high enough or the uniqueness is not good enough and so on or it's not feasible by going through the process of talking to people in your environment talking to the people in all four quadrants of your opportunity environment you'll get a pretty good picture about whether there is the possibility of adaptation. And if there isn't, you would look for ways. I mean, if everyone rejects your idea and says it's way, way, way ahead of its time, perhaps there's something you can do that is a little less ahead of its time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there's the way, you know, I remember I met with the people from uh, Book My Show. Which, uh, which has become a successful company. I don't know if they make money, but they've certainly become the dominant player in the market. And they started back in the 90s. And they were way ahead of their time because the technology simply didn't exist to do this kind of thing online. So they had to adapt their model. They didn't give up. They adapted their model to offline. There was still a need in the market for a universal platform for booking shows. It wasn't that there wasn't a need, but the technology wasn't there. There was a gap. So they did it a different way. And eventually the technology caught up with them. Okay. So you really need to look at, by looking thoroughly at all four quadrants in, in, of your environment, you can see where is there a gap? Is the, is the model, can I not create the model because the technology is there or is the technology there, but the market isn't necessarily there? Uh, and then how can I adjust and perhaps start with a smaller market? What can I do? 
you, you're not going to be answering these questions with a fair degree of accuracy unless you do the research. I think the, the auditing process and the environmental awareness will give you the answers you need, usually. Okay, but most people don't go through this step. As I said, most people, most, the vast majority of entrepreneurs simply use the Xerox machine. Yeah. So Richard, have you been in conversation with some of the investors in India? And what is your take? Uh, you know, we, we do see a lot of, uh, at least, not anymore though, but in the last, say maybe the last decade, a lot of the uh, innovation that came into India was basically a copy of what models were, you know, being successful in the US and then you know, we suddenly found an Expedia of India. We suddenly found, uh, you know, like the booking engines over here. Then we had so many things like that. So have you had an opportunity to talk to investors and and, and, and what is what do you make of that? And, and I'm again asking with respect to the whole opportunity analysis. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, the thing is that in, 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 uh, in most tech areas, mm -hmm. There is a strong belief, and it's probably proven out by facts, that in many business areas, there's only room for one or two players to succeed. Absolutely. Because of network effects. True. So typically what we see with most of these uh, segments is that a first mover comes in, copies a model that was in the US or elsewhere. Uh, perhaps the first mover succeeds. Maybe he doesn't, maybe the second mover succeeds, but there usually aren't too many winners. Uh, there's usually a, a lot of losers and perhaps after a bloodbath of competition and a lot of money wasted, a lot of VC money wasted, there might be a winner. Uh, there might be an Ola that emerges who copies Uber. There might be uh, uh, I, you know, various local versions of an American concept that eventually wins the game and everyone else loses. Uh, that's fine for the winners. I, I, I would think that uh, unfortunately that model creates an enormous number of losers. And if you're really looking at the universe of companies and startups, you don't just want to look at the ones who've attracted some funding that you've heard of. For every company that's attracted funding, there's another 100, 200, 300, 400 that have attracted almost no funding or zero funding. So I would say this Xerox machine model of copying the, the America is, is in general a pretty poor way of approaching opportunities for Indian, invest, Indian uh, entrepreneurs. But I by, think, by the way, Richard, that's a thing of the past now. I think uh, today investors look at, uh, so, so there's a whole segment of VCs who only invest in India for India to begin with. Uh, and then there's a next set of investors who, who have only look, started looking at companies which are, to begin with, from day one, are looking at global products and not just domestic markets. So I think we have moved away from that. I think 2016 was the next version of the Indian startup industry, which, uh, which is, which is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. From the investor, in, from the investor standpoint, that is correct. Yeah. From the entrepreneur standpoint, it is not correct. Okay. So Indian entrepreneurs, even if they're looking at a model in which they're trying to start a global company from India, again, they will typically choose their opportunity by using a Xerox machine. Or they will have some other tweak or slight differentiation which unfortunately generally is not based on useful service for their customers or some sort of model of higher efficiency. In other words, a better, more efficient business model. Uh, I, I've seen very few of these copycats who actually offer something worthwhile. From whatever perspective they're starting, whatever the latest trend is in the venture capital industry that they're trying to follow. Generally, again, uh, they're not doing it properly, and that's why the vast majority of them fail. 
if you're if you're planning to be an entrepreneur and do a startup, you have to understand that. Uh, you know, it's, I would recommend any entrepreneur to get a subscription to Traxon. You're familiar with Traxon. Yes. And just take a look. For example, India has, is full of fintech entrepreneurs. Yeah. Take a look at all the companies in fintech. Thousands and thousands and thousands of fintech startups. Take a look at all, all, all the segments and all the people in the segment you're trying to enter. Study them. Study all your competitors, study everyone in the industry and see how they're different from you and, 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 and what they're doing. And then, then actually see whether you're different and whether you're servicing customer needs, if you have anything better to offer. Most people do not do that. Unfortunately, I would say that most, most entrepreneurs are very self-absorbed, okay? They're like the ant on that little landscape and they aren't really doing what they need to do to understand how they can create a business that isn't just a copycat and that can achieve huge global scale. Very few people are actually doing that. Even though the VCs, VCs obviously want it. There's no doubt that you're right about that. Of course they want it. So there's a question from Sanjay. Uh, mm. so that, uh, it's a slightly interesting one. So he's saying, how do we evaluate an opportunity when we are a late entrant into a segment? When uh, we are what? A late entrant. You know, like they're entering the segment pretty late. Uh, for example, you know, a sales CRM software or an e-commerce company. I uh, think it's easier, actually. Okay. When you're entering a segment later, it's you are able to then evaluate the experience of customers in that segment and find out where the gaps are, where's the friction, okay? If, you, if you're in a completely new segment, for instance, I, I started the segment of opportunity consulting. Who could I, I couldn't go and talk to the customers of other opportunity consultants because there weren't any, right? But if, if, you enter, if you're a late entrant, you can go in and uh, you, uh, you should definitely start talking to companies in that segment who are customers of existing incumbent companies and ask them, what are they happy with? What are they not happy with? If those customers, if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a segment that's like B2B that is selling to then somebody else, you can talk to their customers and, and see how down the value chain this product or service is actually working out. And where are the gaps? Where is the friction? Okay. The trouble, the thing is that in most products and services, there is a failure to deliver service up to the, up to the way it should be. Most companies are not delivering the scale or quality of service that they could be. So you need to talk to customers and find out what's missing. Are there opportunities in that? Are, are these incumbent players missing things? It's quite possible that they are. So I think it's a, it's a big advantage to enter an industry that has incumbent players. Uh, so Sanjay, I guess that answers your question. So here's a leading question from that thought, uh, Richard, that I have. A lot of entrepreneurs, you know, when they come and talk to me, they, they usually have this question. Uh, what is your take on, you know, an opportunity which is billions of dollars worth versus an opportunity which has got a smaller market share of say maybe 3 billion or 5 billion? Uh, is, it, is it bad to be an entrepreneur with for about 10 years working for a or having a startup or a company which has got about 20 people, 25 people, and you're growing at a positive CAGR of 20, 25% and a revenue of like say about 50, 60 million dollars of that $3 billion opportunity versus, you know, a fast hyper growth kind of a company where the market is also expanding. So what's your take on that? Well, I think first it starts with your own mission statement. Mm -hmm. You might be a kind of guy who only wants to have three employees ever in his life. You right. might not care if you make a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, 
you need to under the i think the entrepreneur has to understand what he wants your mission what is your personal mission why are you doing this uh if you are addressing some service requirement or pain point in the environment and it doesn't necessarily result in a multi-billion dollar business is that a problem for you or not if it isn't then so what who cares you might not want to have a multi-billion dollar business i know at my age i certainly wouldn't mm -hmm. who needs it right so it depends it really depends what you want that's my opinion and 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 ultimately then i don't think that scale or ultimate scale is the objective scale again is a consequence all right if google didn't provide useful service to its customers then it would not have such large scale am i correct okay. the reason google is a ubiquitous product is because i mean i remember the the late 90s when every search engine was terrible really terrible you could not find anything on the internet because every none of the search engines worked and then google came along and it was a dramatic improvement it was a miracle in other words right and it was free a value arbitrage right if you can now i'm sure the founders of google in fact there's a story that they apparently were trying to sell google to yahoo for like a million dollars yeah. i'm sure they they didn't start google because they were planning to become billionaires they started it because you know they said search engines suck let's figure out a better way of doing this service right that's really what matters not the size and scale that you're shooting for the service matters so sure. totally agree with you okay that's the focus that's where the focus needs to be not greed need and greed doesn't work great uh there's a question again uh what are your thoughts on opportunities in services like you know valuation financial modeling auditing these have been going on for a long time uh and if somebody wants to start a service or a company like this uh okay so look if you're in a in a business where you have numerous competitors yeah i again stress this fact talk to people who are your potential customers and ask them what is their experience with their current service provider talk find understand the changes in the domain that is influencing this industry it could be technology it could be other domain factors look at the business models of the incumbents in the industry understand the mission statements and the actual missions being followed by the incumbents in the industry and by doing that understand how you can provide better service ideally at a lower cost how can you be more effective and more efficient either both of them if possible one of them if possible how can you do that you will not figure it out on your own without this information you need to go out there and do this research and this isn't just market research okay i'm not just a believer in market research all four segments of your opportunity environment ultimately will have to work together and be aligned in order for you to create a successful business and opportunities can come in any areas of this any areas it could be that the mission of incumbent players is wrong it doesn't reflect the actual desires of their customers i've seen this over and over again okay it could be anywhere in your in your environment where there's opportunity but you need to do the survey you need to do the audit you have to understand that's my opinion if you go blindly and rely on just luck or you know a lot of entrepreneurs say you know i go with my gut but actually it's been proven that gut is only pa pattern recognition you know we all learn by pattern recognition
And if you go with your gut, typically you just go with your past learnings. And that isn't necessarily correct. Future-oriented opportunities aren't necessarily based on past learnings. Okay? So if you're trying to, to change the rule book, going with your gut probably isn't going to work. You need to understand what's around you. So one last question, Richard. I know you've, yes. you've given us just an hour. Uh, there's a question which is asking you, what's your take on the industrial IoT opportunity in India at the moment? Have you a take on it? I'm not an expert on the IoT opportunity. Obviously, IoT is a trend that is unstoppable. Uh, it's also a trend that is overhyped. Okay. Let's face it. Uh, in, in, if you're there, the, 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 the person is asking for the, specifically the industrial IoT opportunity. So, but I think it's probably something that is going to only be taken by uh, large organized sector firms. So, and I think uh, it's most likely the case that Indian firms will follow uh, international firms in their learnings on how they can use IoT. Frankly, uh, again, a technology itself or the fact that you can use IoT isn't necessarily an opportunity unless it actually creates a lot more efficiency or a lot more effectiveness. Simply doing it because it's there isn't necessarily a good idea. Yeah. I think you have to look at how can IoT increase my service or increase my efficiency? I mean, basically opportunities focus on these two things, efficiency or effectiveness. And I, and I, and I suspect that given that most firms in the world don't really understand how IoT can help them, that Indian companies will be able to benchmark the, uh, the, the success or failure of other companies around the world. And it's probably true that the multinationals that are operating in the country will carry that knowledge to them. And there'll also be consultants who, uh, who will specialize in this, probably already are specializing in this, and can uh, give the lessons learned. Uh, so, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of information available. If somebody's interested in this, particularly as a business, to, do, to supply IoT to the industrial sector, again, I would suggest that they carefully audit the segment to see where IoT has been successful so that they can apply the lessons learned already and look for gaps and value gaps where they can plug it in. Sure. I think the bigger trend in industry is that industrial companies need to understand that all products are actually services. I think uh, General Electric is trying to save itself, not only by cutting costs, but also going with the trend of saying, okay, we don't just make widgets. There's an entire value chain of service on each side of that widget that we can also supply. And I think uh, IoT fits, potentially fits into that in order to be into that value ch uh, chain of service to the customer, not just to the OEM. So if you're selling products to an OEM or you're selling it to a distributor, uh, you, you perhaps through IoT, you can also embed value that you can also deliver to a consumer. And that's what people, that's what a lot of companies are looking for with IoT, to extend the value chain of service so that you can transform yourself, not in, just in, from a, a widget manufacturer, but actually to a, a service provider on both sides. I actually uh, gave this advice to my client, Essel Propac, which they followed. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a commodity producer of tubes and Thanks. they were facing huge margin pressures. But I found that there were hundreds of companies in the world that needed advice on how to create safer tubes and they knew a lot about that and they transformed themselves to a from a concept to tube solutions provider to manufacturing companies that use tubes 
for the packaging their products and wanted them to be, be safer and have a longer shelf life. I think that sort of lesson applies to many other companies that can give a longer value chain of service to their customers Got it. by looking for these opportunities to provide service. So thanks Richard. There, yeah, sorry. Oh, Anyways, yeah. I do have more time if you're interested. I could, I could do another few minutes if you yeah, want. So if you've got any more questions, please do write to us. Uh, yeah. I think asked Richard. Uh, yeah, I've given my email, which I will. No, I think Richard just moved to your final slide. So yeah, that will kind of help everybody again. Yeah, why is that not working? There it is. Yeah, so that's my email address and my website. And uh, there's a lot of videos on Opguru, the YouTube channel. There's, uh, if you, uh, if you register or subscribe on that, and, and uh, you can also uh, write to me on my website or write my email. Happy to, or join me on LinkedIn. So any other question folks, or we let Richard go? Yeah, sure, please, Varsha, ask your question. Sorry, Richard, somebody's typing. No, no problem. Very interesting question that uh, Varsha is asking you. Okay. He's kind of taking up on the fact that you said most Indian companies tend to copy. Mm. Uh, so she's asking you the question, how do you train yourself to start thinking differently? I think... Uh... I cover this a lot in my book, and I, if you're if you're really interested in this topic, I suggest you get my book, The Power of Opportunity. Okay. I I, I call it the uh, opportunity mindset. I have two chapters. One is on the opportunity mindset, and another one is on the opportunity mindset. Uh, basically, I think the key is that you must be irreverent. And what do I mean by irreverent? Generally, we don't question our assumptions about who, what, where, why, and when. We accept the rules of the game. We're too willing to accept that this is how things are done. This is how the mass of people think. If you want to be on the right, cur right tail of the bell curve, where all the profits are, you cannot have a mentality that thinks like the people in the middle of the bell curve. The vast majority of companies in any sector not only have similar products and services and similar mediocre profits, but they also have a similar mentality. And they play by a certain set of rules that you don't need to accept, okay? In order to understand that, you need to be able to understand what are the rules of the game in whatever business you're playing in. And you have to question them all and say, are these right? Are they actually providing service, useful service to customers? Or are there giant gaps? Is there a lot of dissatisfaction? Is there friction and how can I address it? You, and in order to do that, you have to question the rules. You can't be religiously devoted to rules. And I cover that in my book. You have to think out of the box. Okay, now sometimes you can be ahead of your time. Imagine, I, I gave the example of Freddie Mercury, a nice Parsi boy who became this uh, rock icon. If he had tried to do that in the 1950s, I don't think it would have worked. I don't think people would have been willing to accept him, yeah? So he was able to benefit from the fact that people were able to accept a, a gay guy being uh, this outrageous gay guy. In the 50s, that wouldn't have worked. So if you, if you try to break the rules that can't be broken, fine. But there are many rules that can be broken, okay? There are, many, there are many habits and rules of business that are followed by people simply because everyone else does for so, because of social proof. 
Okay. So it's important to look at that. And I recommend uh, that that person read my book. And uh, that'll give them a, that'll give a big dose of uh, how to change your, uh, from an, op an opportunity mindset to an opportunity mindset. Thanks, Richard. That was really useful. Uh, what I would also suggest and request, Richard, is if we could meet you once a month uh, sure. on, on various other topics, maybe, and then, you know, do insightful sessions like this. That'd I'd be, be happy to. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks a ton, Richard. And, My pleasure. Uh, and we promise to kind of get you hooked up with all the other chapters who would love to kind of Wonderful. do your sessions. Uh, okay. And folks, please do write to Richard, pick up his books. Richard, your books are available on Amazon right now? Yes, they are. My books are on Amazon. Bookstores are closed, but Amazon is open. And okay. I encourage you to look at my videos on uh, YouTube. There's a lot of, a lot of videos. Uh, and because uh, nowadays, people, a lot of people don't want to read books. But uh, cool. if you like the videos, maybe you'll want to read the book. I, I think uh, it's a topic well worth delving into because if you choose the wrong opportunities through whatever laziness, Xerox machine thinking, you know, you'll have plenty of time to regret it. Got it. You got, you really, it really is worthwhile to go through the process of, of thinking through opportunities very carefully. Yeah. And thank you very much, Naveen. And thank to all of you who uh, came on today. I appreciate that you've given your time for this session. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Okay. Can you share the name of your books? People are asking in the chat room. Yes. Let me, for some back to the... Yeah, for some reason, it's not uh, working properly. Let me get this thing out of there. Hold on. Let me, let me just. Well, Dishant has sent a link also on the chat, folks. I, I, I just can't understand why this isn't working. Rahul, can you just check from the back end? I'm not able to uh, move it up and down. Move, I'm not able to move it up and down, yeah. There it is. Okay. So the book I'm particularly referring to on the right, The Power of Opportunity, it's, uh, it was published in December by Penguin. And it, it goes very thoroughly into this opportunity process. It gives the, the background uh, about, how you sh about everything about this process, including the process, process itself in great detail. The, uh, so if you're interested in that, I think that's the right book for you. Uh, if you're interested in benchmarking the stories of some successful Indian entrepreneurs who have started with nothing, I'd suggest you pick up this book, Master Opportunity, and make it big. Very easy reading. It has some really great stories uh, about guys like Subhash Chandra, Harsh Mariwal, Ode Kotak, Aditya Puri, uh, Dr. Hamid, Nirmal Jain, and so on. Many others, many industries, many guys, a few guys you've never heard of, but you've heard of their companies. And I think it isn't focused on, you know, their life. It's focused specifically on how did they find opportunities and what struggles and, and learnings that they have in this whole process of opportunity in order to make it big. Yeah. And these are, and I think it's a very approachable book because all these guys basically started with nothing. They all took opportunities and started. I didn't put guys like Tata Birla in there or, or Ambani because those guys didn't start with nothing. Uh, so I think it's a book that, uh, that everyone can enjoy. And it's really interesting because Subhash Chandra, who's in this book, uh, he was also my client. Uh, I think he's recently regretted the fact that he invested a couple billion dollars in a very bad opportunity, because, which he took advantage, which he entered based on gut feeling, I, I suspect, rather than thorough analysis. Uh, you know, his earlier opportunities like Z and Nestle Propac were phenomenally successful, which probably, and when he hired me, he said, actually, I'm the only one in this group who is looking at opportunities. But even his process of opportunity was, was inadequate, to be honest, which is why he chose this infrastructure thing that has cost him so much. I think most of the people in this book also, let's face it, they didn't, most of them did not have 
their own process of opportunity. But some of them you can see through what they did, how they took opportunities. And I've extracted the lessons learned from their lives and their business careers to help you understand how you can find opportunities. So I think it's an interesting book. The Power of Opportunity is much more structured as far as following the process and understanding the process that you know people pay me a lot of money to use. It's something you can do for yourself. And that's what this book will help you to do. So Richard, one more request, Richard, uh, which I've been getting on the side chat now, uh, is given your experience, can you do a workshop sometime in the future which could basically teach how Indians to sell in the US market? How Indians should sell in the US market? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I'm not sure I'm the right guy for that. Okay. Uh, I haven't lived in the US in 30 years. Okay. Uh, I think I'd be, uh, and, and I think I'm not an expert on the US market given, I used to, as a trade commissioner, my job was to help American companies enter foreign markets. Okay. So I'm much more of an expert on how companies should sell in the Indian market or the Indonesian market or the Italian market and on places where I, where I uh, worked. Got it. Uh, I helped, uh, I had over 2000 American clients who I helped to enter, for example, those markets. Not the so, uh, but the US market, no, I, I, <laughs> I don't think that's, I, I'm the right guy for that. I, okay. I think we could do a workshop, but let's focus on something else. Sure, definitely. Yeah. And, and people are asking for a workshop on, again, evaluating opportunity. You know? I think that's, that's, uh, that would be more, more, uh, more applicable at this point. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I hope to we'll look forward to our next, our next event. Absolutely. Okay. Take Thank care. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.